Red deck. There we go. All right. So um, our our fearless leaders today are going to be uh, Dr. Brenda Huber and Terry Murphy. Um, they are with us here on the panel, and they will be introducing the rest of the speakers uh, as their sections of the presentation come up. Um, we have with us uh, Catherine Banks, Michelle Lansing, um, and I'm I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, Doctor K, but we have, we have you as well. Um, didn't want to do do it live and butcher your names too badly. So as I said, we are hosted today by the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. My name is Luke Wortley. I am the director of the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center, housed here at the Indiana Rural Health Association. We are a technical assistance provider and uh, convening space for digital health professionals, um, direct service providers, as well as prospective patients and anybody who has any advocacy uh, in the uh, equity and justice space related to digital health and broadband usage. Um, we are funded through the federal government, through the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth and the Health Resources and Services Administration. We cover the four states of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. If you are outside of that region, please feel free to contact us anyway. We will get you in touch with one of the other 11 regional resource centers um, for any kind of TA inquiry or any other kind of inquiry that uh, might lead to a future collaboration. Uh, in support, we also have the Association of Community Mental Health Authorities, the Community Behavioral Health Care Association of Illinois, the Illinois Association of Medicaid Health Plans, the Illinois Critical Access Hospital Network, the Illinois Health and Hospital Association, and the Mental Health Summit, with other additional support from the VNA Foundation and Sprague Memorial Institute. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and hand it off to Dr. Brenda Huber. I believe, Nancy, you had a few words that you wanted to say, am I right? Yeah, I just want to thank Luke and the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center for being a host of this event. Uh, they've been extraordinarily wonderful to work with, and we really, really do appreciate that. Um, I just want to is, give you a little bit of background on Partnership for Connect Illinois. We're a nonprofit, Illinois nonprofit organization that seeks to advance uh, broadband and telehealth. And we've been in the working for the last six, seven years on trying to address this particular issue of the uh, youth mental health crisis. And we received funding from Sprague Memorial Institute and the VNA Foundation uh, to do demonstration projects in the Chicago Public Schools. And now for the last couple of years, we've been working on identifying online behavioral health tools that can be available uh, through uh, to K through 12 uh, students. Uh, it's a huge issue. I mean, every day in the news, uh, we see another story of the mental health crisis that's affecting kids. I mean, last week only, there were three children, three students, high school students killed outside a Chicago uh, uh, charter school. And um, this is, there has to be a way to deal with this. Uh, the Surgeon General has said, that uh, this is uh, students now or young people now are uniquely hard to navigate and he called the mental health challenges absolutely devastating. Um, so we really need to lift up our, uh, broaden our perspective, uh, band together and figure out ways that we can ad address these important issues. I also wanna thank Brenda and uh, Terry uh, for their extraordinary help over the last couple of years, you know, and I just want to take a couple of minutes and just say a little bit of background on Brenda, and then she'll introduce everyone else. Um, Brenda uh, transitioned from her position as a professor and executive director within Rush University Medical Center in the spring of 2022 to start her own consultation business, uh, drawing upon her experience as a middle school teacher and a foster parent, school psychologist, and outpatient therapist, and project director of many local, state, and federal grants. She provides a systems consultation to communication in engaging collaborative and innovative solutions to children's mental health needs. She's previously spent 20 years directing training programs for psychologists at Illinois State University. Her interests include relationship-oriented and empowering interventions for children and families, 
uh, children's mental health and educational equity, exploring the avenues by which research and practice can influence public policy. So we're in good hands. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brenda, who will take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. We're so glad that you can all be with us here to to um, talk about digital resources in schools to address um, children's mental health needs. I am going to try to, um, are you all seeing my notes or are you seeing the real screen? Real screen? No, Katie says seeing notes. Um, we're seeing we're both. Seeing both. Yes. You're seeing both. Okay, let me try that one more time. How about now? Perfect. Great, all right. So I'm gonna jump right in talking about the public health model of children's mental health. I've been consulting with communities and schools for about 15 years, and I become more and more um, convinced that the public health model is our solution. A public health emergency calls for a public health solution. Um, the goal of the public health model is to match the intensity of the services to the intensity of the needs and intervene at the earliest possible point to prevent suffering and disease. Fortunately, this is essentially the model that schools already use for reading, for writing, for math. Um, we do interventions for all students to teach and uplift um, their academics and their social emotional well-being, and then we provide more um, supports for children who need more. And so I'm gonna, we're gonna refer to this public health model multiple times as we talk today. The large triangle represents all of the children in a district. And we do things at tier one, meaning we do universal interventions. It's what we do for every child and family in the district to promote the mental well being of those students. Um, as you, the triangle narrows and goes up, you'll see tier two. These are students who are a little bit off track developmentally, and they're at risk for developing an actual mental health diagnosis. And we have additional interventions that we layer on at tier two. At tier three are young people that are already experiencing some mental health um, disorders. And um, this is the level we typically think of as providing one-on-one um, -on -one therapy. And then we've got tier four, which should be a very small portion of the student population that um, is involved in multiple systems. And we really have to look at the family as the unit of um, treatment. So the goal is to keep those um, the top tier three and tier four groups as small as possible. So tier one, again, is for 100% of the students. Tier two, we typically think if we're on track, um, there's gonna be about 15% of kids who need a little bit something more. And then at tier three, about 10%. And then at tier four, maybe two or three percent. So we try to keep those top groups as small as possible because they involve many more resources um, because those needs are greater. Now, currently in um, the U.S., the conservative estimates are that um, there are more than 15 percent of kids who are in those tier three and tier four categories. And some are saying even more than 40 percent of our um, young people are suffering needs at that level, meaning our triangle isn't even really triangle shaped anymore. So prior to the pandemic, what was happening is schools were providing their tier one, their two, and those early tier three services to kids who have kind of garden variety, ADHD, anxiety, depression, and so on. And for the kids who had greater needs, they were handing those off to community behavioral health providers for more intense and long-term treatment. Sometimes those providers were integrated in a setting where um, students spend a lot of time. Sometimes they were co-located, meaning they're just simply sharing space. And then sometimes students would go to see a clinic-based therapist. And this was the multi-tiered system of support that is existing in most schools prior to the pandemic. However, right now we have a drastic imbalance between the demand for mental health services in the community and the supply of product supply of providers. They're just not enough community-based providers. So there are long wait lists for individual therapy and these higher levels of treatment, tier three and tier four treatments. There are also barriers to connecting these students with the available treatment options. So we might have some slots open, but kids don't have that particular insurance, or they might be too far away at a distance. There are various um, barriers to making sure that all of those resources are being accessed. 
And we also know that we have a lot of students who have needs and nobody even knows about them yet, even though we have these wait lists. So um, there's difficulty coordinating across the various settings when we get to those students that have a lot of needs. This is what's going on. And um, there just are not enough providers to do and overcome these various barriers. In the schools themselves, we also have a drastic imbalance between the demand for folks who have training and social emotional supports and um, the, the supply of actual providers. So typically in the schools, we're talking about school support personnel, like school psychologists, social workers, counselors, nurses, speech language pathologists. These are folks who typically are doing a big um, chunk of the tier one, tier two, and early tier three services. Right now, post shutdown, the context of tier one has changed. There are many more disruptive behaviors in the classroom than prior to the shutdown. Um, there are um, lots and lots of difficulties with student absences, students not coming to school. And these are challenges that are na national, um, uh, nationwide. Also educator absences. Um, teachers and, and other educator professionals are not um, attending as regularly as prior to the pandemic, and many of them are experiencing burnout. So the tier one context where we're supporting all of the students in concert is suffering. There's also a missed opportunity at tier two. So we call this earlier intervention or upstream intervention. There are a lot of unidentified or unaddressed symptoms what we call subclinical needs that are worsening because they're not identified and kids are not getting that, that tier two um, support because we just don't have enough people to be able to do all that is necessary. A lot of people are talking about doing universal screening to try to identify those emerging concerns, which is a great idea if we have the supports available to actually meet the needs of the kids that we identify. Right now, school professionals will tell you they are putting out fires. They're reacting to crises and stabilizing students. So integrating earlier intervention digital resources and services into the current existing ecosystem for social emotional learning, for mental health, um, multi-tiered systems of support can be the answer. So the imperative is this early intervention so we can increase the capacity of the school-based mental health program so they provide the needed level of support in an accessible medium whenever it's needed, wherever it's experienced. Now, I will say this presentation is not about direct-to-consumer self-help apps, and it's not about teletherapy. It's about a continuum of supports that um, will meet those early tier one, two, and tier three service needs. So the um, Partnership for Connected Illinois, with funding from the Sprague Institute and VNA, has been engaged in discovering what is out there. What are the digital telehealth resources and services that exist to do this upstream earlier intervention work to build the capacity of the school? We've also been identifying schools and partners for pilots. And we have been beginning to pilot some of these vendors in Illinois K-12 schools, which is what we're so excited to share with you today. We have three um, school schools of panelists um, to present for you. We are identifying various needs and issues. And our goal from um, Partnership for Connected Illinois is to develop some step-by-step -step guides for doing this very nuanced, sophisticated work of integrating these resources into the existing ecosystem. Our hope is that as more and more schools start to do this, they can use these step-by-step -step guides to more um, successfully and independently implement and integrate. Um, we're hoping down the road maybe to have like a professional learning community where a whole cohort of pilots are working together to implement tools. We're looking for pilots and we are hoping to um, pilot in a number of very different settings, rural, suburban, and urban, which we have um, here to present for you today, different populations, elementary, middle, and high school, with different issues, right, with different age groups of students. And then we're looking at four different scenarios um, that we've thought of. One is working directly with school districts themselves, working through school-based health centers, working alongside with a behavioral health partner that works with schools, or working through a special education co-op. 
So next up, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Terry Murphy. Um, Terry is um, a, a faculty member at Cornell University. He is a digital health expert who has um, done the same kind of discovery work for employer coalitions across the um, country on all kinds of different health needs. And his focus for this project is on K-12 mental health resources for the upstream, the early intervention. Terry? Well, thank you, Brenda. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to take about 15 minutes, uh, and, I, and I have a lot of uh, information. We're going to cover the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what I'm going to attempt to do is, is give you, um, in this 15 minutes, um, I'm going to present it two different ways. We don't have the time to get into specific uh, companies, uh, although that might come up in, in some of the um, panel discussion as some of our pilot schools are, are working with specific vendors. But I'm going to give you some um, examples of companies in terms of um, the breadth of their services. Um, again, not by name, but by um, by a graphic. Um, and, and, and I'll do three or four companies that way. And then I'm going to do it sort of horizontally. I'm going to share with you what we, first of all, what we looked at, uh, but we have cross compared these different offerings. They are not all the same. In fact, none of them are the same. Uh, so there's quite a bit of different nuance and 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 I'll, I'll, I'll dive into that in just a second. Uh, go to the next slide. This is a, um, do, do you have the ability to go to them? Yeah, there we go. This is some of the companies we screened. Not all these made it into our side-by-side. -side. Some of these players are, are, are niche players. Others have a fairly broad and, and applicable set of services. We really wanted to focus on companies that were in the business of working with K-12 schools. They may do some other things with employers and, and uh, um, insurance companies, but they were uh, equipped to to work with K-12 schools. So it's um, a subset of, of some of these that we really have spent quite a bit of time with. Um, this will give you a sense of the process we went through. We took um, a good number of those companies and we compared them in four areas. One, the services and resources that they offered. Two, um, what their onboarding um, coordination was with the school district, their reporting to the school district. That's really all about the process of working with schools. Uh, three, what their business model was. And just to summarize, there's some schools, there's some uh, um, services out there that have an app, they have therapists, they may have coaches as well. Um, and they'll go anywhere from block scheduling specific for your district. So you fill up the slots to on-demand scheduling to um, just a, 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 an app with different resources and, and asynchronous coaching. And I'll get into that a little bit more when I do the services profile. And lastly, we, we looked at some of the specifics of the businesses. Uh, these are not old, long-standing businesses in, in any case. I think the oldest one is, is uh, 12 years. Um, some of them are as young as, as four years. But as you can imagine, they've become enormously popular and valuable and, um, and uh, in demand. Uh, the reason I have Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 in red on the left is uh, in about five minutes, I'm actually going to show you the comparison um, across those services. I'm going to kind of give you a sense of what we mean by tier one services. The, the tier one Brenda was referring to, what we mean by tier two, what we mean by uh, tier three. And as you can see in that profile of services, there's differences in the age range that these companies will support. Um, there's Some of them offer services for parents. One of them offers services for parents only. Um, and some of them offer services for school staff in support of their kids. Next slide. So here's an example. Remember I said I'd do a couple of verticals. Here's one company, and this is a, a depiction. Uh, and it's nice. This is, happens to be a company that supports all three tiers. Not all of them do that. Um, but uh, this is, and in, in when you see the Connect Plus, that's sort of tier one stuff. Um, coaching is tier two and care is tier three. 
Um, they don't all group that nicely, by the way. But this one, I thought, is uh, this this gives you a sense of of you know what's under the hood with some of these. You can see the digital front deer, uh, front door to triage members, um, on demand coach chat, and then really importantly, this digitized students will do a survey or their parents will, and it will queue up content based on the uh, and the the questions that were answered. So that's one. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this is a company that's strength was in tier two. So um, they have a, a solution, uh, what they call brief solution focused therapy, uh, 30 minute sessions with a therapist uh, meant to, this is squarely tier two, meant to address a, a certain specific issue. Um, this is a company also that will escalate you to tier three with therapists um, if, if that's the identified need. Let's go to the next one. Um, this is a very interesting company that's just tier one and tier two, um, but a lot of uh, self-guided um, um, content. This is great for, for teenagers. Um, peer support, very interesting service with this company. This is a company out of the UK originally, uh, and they have created um, peer, moderated peer chat rooms so that depending on the issues that the the um, individual uh, is is confronting, they'll put you in a, a a chat room to talk to others that have similar issues. But there's a, a clinician that's moderating uh, the the messaging back and forth, so uh, nothing inappropriate gets in there. And finally, here's an example of a company that's working with parents only, which is very appealing in some settings. Um, you can see the one-on-one um, -on -one parent coaching uh, sessions where the parent can work with a coach to discuss their issues and, and consider um, responses. And then there's a really um, robust set of um, mental health webinar topics. Next slide. So that was an example vertically of a couple of um, offerings by different of these vendors. Here is just going to here we're just focusing on tier one and now I've, I'm going across some of the different offerings. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of detail behind all these, but um, some of the resources uh, we mentioned it in a, a moment ago, uh, some of these organizations have screening questions that can help identify the, the nature of, of the issues with self directed and curated content and various interactive tools. Now, depending on the screening, uh, the answers to the screening questions, you may actually be auto escalated to a tier two or a tier three. That's that's available in some of these resources. Um, but also st sticking with tier one for a minute, um, there are um, some of these players will come in and actually give presentations to uh, students or to staff. Um, there's I mentioned parent topical webinars, one-on-one -on -one family coach, which is a very interesting and, and popular um, offering, asynchronous chat, um, and then sort of a different category. But a couple of these folks actually have screeners, uh, formal screeners. And, and you know, notice up earlier under individual content, I used the word screening questions. That's probably better worded as survey questions to differentiate between you know, full on screeners. Uh, next slide. Um, so now we're gonna talk about tier two for a minute. Um, 30 minute therapist or coach sessions, um, different pricing with those depending on, on what's chosen. Uh, but this, just to pause on this for a minute, this is pretty huge. Um, certified coaches uh, can support a lot of needs and it's not the cost or the the shortage crisis that we have with therapists. So this is a rapidly growing emerging category. These um, certified coaches. Now the thought that's in in your mind is, uh, well, what are these certifications? And that's where there's there's a lot of detail to to uh, sift through with these vendors. But um, 
but a great option here. The solution brief, uh, solution focused therapy, skill building, um, brief uh, evidence based curricula. Uh, moderated, I mentioned this earlier on one of these, and moderated anonymous peer chat groups, one on one synchronous or asynchronous clinical chat, um, and um, moderated asynchronous parent support groups. And finally, um, in a bit of its own category, these educator sessions and, and self-paced professional development, some of these companies will offer CE credits for, for your staff in taking some of these programs. Finally, uh, tier three examples. And this again is not our focus so much, um, but it's 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 part of the um it, it, it's part of the um uh, landscape. Uh, and it's very important, and, and it's a real benefit when you have the opportunity to escalate into that within this framework. This gets to sort of the um, coordination between the school and these service providers, because we do look for what are the escalation protocols, what are the triggers, where does it then go within the school, because often this is where the school wants to uh, consider its staff or its contracted uh, um, uh, clinical partner. But this is, you know, it, it, a, very, a very good element of this is, of course, there's quite a number of clinicians with these organizations, typically, um, with different backgrounds. And, and you, in some cases, can choose your clinician based on uh, some profiles. So there's some matching done. Uh, then, of course, teletherapy. Um, and these sessions can include online tools. Um, some are more um, flexible in terms of time, time and availability. Um, there's usually the ability to communicate in between sessions. And some of these folks have uh, Zoom check-ins with parents or the, the uh, educators. And finally, this is a whole interesting area, and a lot of these companies are innovating uh, quickly, but they're developing dashboards so that you, the school staff, can look at the um, the usage and even the progress. Usually it's anonymized. Um, there are some options if you request them, but usually this is anonymized to um, protect, obviously, identities and such. Uh, is there another slide after that? Oh, of course. So um, this is hot news. Uh, actually, it was announced about a month ago, but uh, some of the formal details are just now. This is from a couple days ago. Um, State of California, two of our vendors. We need, know these people very, very well. Um, develop contracts. And the State of California now has those two vendors to service all the children in the state of California. Needless to say, it caused a bit of a delay in some of our interactions on behalf of Illinois schools when this was announced uh, because they're very, very busy, but they're adding a lot to their infrastructure, including language, as, as you can imagine, that's required in California. So with that, um, that's just a bit of a brief uh, tip of the iceberg and I'll pass it back to Brenda. You're, you're muted, Brenda. We are really excited about um, this work in California and watching how things unfold there. Um, they're actually offering these two services, um, Brightline for younger students and Cooth for students all the way up to the age of 25. And it'll be their services will be in 23 different languages. And um, that's one of the things that is really um, great about being involved with um, companies that are able to have a whole um, array of providers um, licensed within our state. Um, and we can overcome barriers for students that need to be connected to someone who's a specialist in some way or shares their um, their culture. So and just, just to, to add, and just ahead. to add one thought to that, um, the point here is these have these um, vendors who were newcomers to the industry just a couple of years ago 
are really coming into their own in terms of awareness and acceptance and, and mass availability. So to summarize, our objective is to supplement the existing earlier intervention services that are in schools already for tier one, tier two, and early tier three to decrease the frequency and intensity of the mental health needs that we're seeing now in the student body and allow the on-site personnel, whether they're from the school or whether they're from an outside behavioral health partner to do their best work both at the upstream, meaning um, the lower levels of acuity and at the downstream, those kids that are um, in those smaller triangles at the top of the, of the triangle. Um, so here in the next three slides, um, I'm going to sort of begin to start talking about some of the things that are emerging as important in the process of implementation. So this is very rudimentary first pieces of what will be going into those step-by-step -step guides that I talked about earlier. So what we know is that every single pilot school has its own unique culture, history, needs, and resources. And so vendor selection is a super important piece that can't be really glossed over. And um, so what, what, we, what we're doing is we're helping each school to review the vendors that are available and their fit. So what ages and grades do they serve? What is their service array? How much does it cost, et cetera? Kind of like the broad strokes and then programmatic choices. What kind of mental health expertise is needed? Um, what languages, what kind of technology needs are out there? And um, how does the vendor get the, um, the resources to students? Um, the hours of operation, um, whether or not they're um, serving families in the summer and on the weekends and those kinds of things when school professionals are not available. And then the business ter terms, the cost structure, what are the requirements um, of the vendor, what are the requirements of the school, and um, looking at the budget. Illinois, um, for those of you on the call that are not from Illinois, Illinois is a huge local autonomy state. We have um, over 900 school districts in Illinois, and each one is completely unique and has within it um, buildings that are have their own unique culture. So this is a really important um, process and uh, at the beginning of implementation that we hope to be able to create you know, uh, a decision tree and various um, questions and um, steps for, for folks to, um, to complete. Uh, we're also identifying a number of key issues, things that are like legal or regulatory considerations, vendor approval and contracting, um, matters of student price, privacy. In Illinois, we have a privacy law called SOPA and different districts interpret SOPA, SOPA in different ways. Um, we also have consent and assent for treatment, how to release information, which varies of course on how old the student is and um, varies by um, school policies and vendor policies. Um, confidentiality and then referral and coordination. One of the beautiful aspects of those dashboards and so on is that school personnel can know what's going on with their kids in treatment and the parents can know um, if those releases are signed so that these um, efforts can be coordinated. And as we layer on services moving up the triangle that those services can be coordinated. It can be a beautiful thing, but it's complicated, right? And so working through these considerations with the district and the vendors is, is really important. Um, crisis procedures. So at any point in time, what does the school do? What does the vendor do when a young person needs more than the, the level of service um, that is being provided? And then use of money. We feel super strongly about helping folks plan towards sustainability. Um, especially rural and urban districts have had all kinds of people come in and offer them the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then once that grant's over or that program's over, that study's over, it's gone. And so we've been really um, working at the outset with folks about how do we keep these, these things going. And then the last slide is about coordination and execution. So um, we have seen all over the state, um, different districts choose some kind of a tool or a um, program and launch it and it flops miserably. And one of the reasons is this key area. 
um, communication and engagement of all the stakeholders. So all of these folks, administrators, school boards, providers, teachers, community members, parents, students, all need to know what is available, know what's going on. Their interests have to be taken into account when implementing something like this. So we work with each district to figure out who are the key personnel going to be that are going to be the champions for this project, who are going to influence um, its its day-to-day um, -day, um, success. And so it might be people who are training staff. Um, it might be the people who are communic communications folks, people who are family engagement people, multilingual coordinators. Who are the key people in this particular district that are going to be at the center of this program's success. And we tend to have a planning or steering team that are high level folks from each of those stakeholder groups that help in um, decision making. And then we have an implementation team and we typically meet with this team every week to um, guide um, and make sure that, um, that things are going as we want them to go, right? As an implementation team. So these are um, nuts and bolts day-to-day um, -day implementers. So um, outreach and engagement, I have bolded because um, communicating about the project um, to all those stakeholders and getting them engaged is important. One of the biggest reasons that these digital tools flop is because nobody uses them. They're the most wonderful tool ever, um, but people don't log on to them. And so outreach and engagement, critical for success, and then data review. So um, at each of these meetings, we are looking at what is utilization, what is the quality of the service that's going out, how are children progressing, and how satisfied are um, the school folks, the vendor, the, the students in, in the, with the partnership and what's being implemented. So um, I am very excited to introduce you to Dr. Katie Bangs. Um, our colleague down at Egyptian Health Department. I say down because it's the very southern part of the state. Um, Egyptian Health Department serves 11 counties, I believe, and they are well known for leadership in training around trauma-informed evidence-based practices. And Katie is their school-based mental health program director. And so, um, Egyptian has a history of doing innovative things with schools across the region. And we are just beginning a partnership with Egyptian. They've written in digital tools into a number of uh, local, state, and federal grants um, for the schools that they serve. And Katie's here to talk to us about it today. Katie? Thank you, Dr. Huber. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so I was asked to kind of talk about the rural perspective of some of our projects. So one, one of the reasons why we pursued different digital options. So as you can imagine, there's not a ton of resources here, but one of the challenges that we have is the incre increased trauma and poverty in our areas that we serve. Um, so this presents a lot of need in the area and then trying to provide um, services and resources for those needs. Part of the, our trauma and our poverty in our areas is due to increases in substance use um, and then also suicide attempts in the past several years. Um, so we do have, unfortunately, a high um, substance use rate. And then subsequently, we are unable to determine if some of our overdose numbers are actual suicide attempts or accidental overdose. So that's been a, a recent discussion within the health department for many of our counties. Um, so we have that increased need that is then contributing to the trauma that our, our students are seeing in the area. They might lose a parent, um, they might lose a sibling and so on and so forth. So we're, it's kind of confounding all of our numbers here. So we are really looking to strengthen or build schools tier one and tier two services as much as we can. And so that's a huge focus of several of my grant projects that I am working on. Um, so if we can get in there a little bit earlier, we're really hoping to kind of help stabilize things before they escalate. Um, one of the big needs is just training on mental and behavioral health needs of our, our youth. Um, one of the big ones is just the causes of behavior that in children, especially the younger they are, the symptoms of different mental health things look very similar across you know, the, the age range, especially under 10. So I'm frequently consulted and asked about uh, behaviors of young children in the schools. 
Sometimes that is explaining the impact of trauma and poverty on our students. I have done several trainings with our schools on this, these concepts. Um, it, it, it's tricky to kind of wrap your head around it. If you don't live and breathe that like I do, it can be really hard to wrap your head around all of those things. Um, so let me go to the next slide. So like I said, we are really looking for more resources. Travel and distance is a huge barrier, so that kind of goes in with transportation, some of our housing, employment. Um, we're seeing a huge need for employment and people having to travel longer distances for employment, including trying to get more mental health professionals here in this area that there's not a lot living here in the area, so they travel here. And so trying to get services outside of the area, a lot of our students are that's a struggle for them. Um, the car breaks down. We don't have a lot of, you know, bus transportation and we don't have a train. We don't have any of those types of things. So that travel and distance is a huge, huge factor. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of these things kind of work together. So employment has a big factor with that. If parents work outside of the area, they might not be able to get their children to services. Um, so that it's, those are huge challenges. Service providers in general kind of hinted at this. It takes a lot for us to get service providers here in this area. We have a shortage of mental health um, personnel just in the rural counties of Southern Illinois, but then also medical um, staff. Um, we don't have a lot of doctors, for example. We have more nurse practitioners and they are wonderful. They really help kind of fill that need and that gap, but we don't have you know other types of specialists in the area. So if there's you know, co-occurring things going on, it can be challenging to get those services for families. Um, kind of going more on just activities, the access to safe activities outside of school and daycare provision. There's one daycare provider in the counties that I serve. Um, the others have either closed down or, you know, but we have one daycare provider across at least four counties. And that's a lot of distance to for families to get their children to daycare. And then they only have so many slots open. So this that creates another challenge. You know, how are behaviors going to have like be addressed if inconsistent daycare provision, if they or how do they have mentors that will get them on a, a better path to resiliency, you know, if they don't have those activities or the access. So next slide. So we've had several strategies used and some of our bigger targets have just been, you know, get getting more resources, but then also well, simultaneously addressing stigma in the area. And there's kind of two parts to the stigma aspect. One is just mental health stigma in general. And that's still live and well here. You know, you pull yourself up by the bootstraps. I've heard that countless of countless times here in this area. But then also just being okay with accessing services through a digital platform. Um, that has been more of a discussion than I I thought it would be. I, you know, I kind of thought like, oh well, you know, this will make it easier and people will just jump on board. And that really has not been the case. And depending on what county we're talking about, some of that is more about connectivity issues versus not being willing to, but there is a huge hesitation about accessing digital platforms. Um, so we have seen that in a lot of our, our platforms that we have piloted and uh, different programs that we have done at Egyptian. So we have done counseling services through a telehealth platform and psychiatry services. So within counseling, we've seen, we've seen mixed results. Our substance use counseling services kind of was a flop. We were able to get different, uh, we had professionals who could set up the Zoom meetings and Zoom in counseling um, professionals and substance use within the schools. And so they had a private counseling space in the school set up for us that they could Zoom in and we were able to connect that way. And it was hardly ever utilized. Um, but we we've done counseling services, you know, more generic counseling services, mental health, behavioral health services outside of that. And that has been moderate su success. It has allowed us to give access to some clients, but not and then others are still very resistant to using that platform, even though that would get rid of the transportation barriers, the cost to barrier that 
might be related to tra uh, transportation. Um, it would reduce those things, but they're very resistant to using that platform. While others have been, you know, they know they know those are barriers, and so they'll take on. They're like, yes, this will solve my problem. So that has had moderate success. Our bi biggest success has been our psychiatry services, and we don't have any child and adolescent psychiatrists in the area, so we have one that provide services through telehealth. Um, so this is kind of a, a, our interesting, where I've gotten some of my ideas from. They go into a med our medical center, which is actually a school-based behavioral health center. And so they meet with nurses and the nurse practitioners, as well as um, having the telehealth session with the psychiatrist. So it, it kind of seems to help bridge that barrier of Yes, it is a di it's digital, but there is an in-person context. So that's that has kind of gotten my wheel my wheel spinning as it were. So we are recently one of our um, other pilots that's not really related to this is our progress monitoring program. And part of the reason we chose to do this was to try to help battle that stigma with tech um, and use it within our our services here at Egyptian Health Department. So, all right, we can go next slide. So Brenda already mentioned this, so I won't, I won't spend much time, but our schools are in crisis mode. So we have lots of need up top. Um, Egyptian services are really tiered the other way. We have less in the tier one, and then we have more in the upper tier. So we are trying to partner with schools to try to stabilize these out. So I won't spend a ton of time on that. But our newest digital project is Kuth, um, mostly because we it'll help supplement our tier one and tier two. It'll provide access to students, teachers, and care caregivers, which will hopefully help in the rural area. I think kids are more likely to use it, but we're we're definitely in the planning stages of who's going to be on the implementation team, um, and that's kind of where our heads are. So, trying to figure out how we can have that in person. Uh, strategy to kind of help facilitate the online usage, kind of like we saw in our psychiatry. So, I mean, that's where we are. We're in the very, very beginning stages. We might be implementing Kuth maybe in August, September time period. So very early on, but that's kind of our history and our thought process with the digital intervention project. So I know I'm over time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Banks. I know you'll be on for our um, Q&A time. So um, participants, if you're having questions about what's going on in the rural communities um, for Dr. Banks, please stay on and, um, and put those in the Q&A so we can talk um, with uh, Katie Moore at the, um, at the end. Next up, we have our urban um, representatives. So Michelle Lansing and Karen Brayo are um, from the Distinctive Schools. This is a charter um, school network in Chicago um, that has nine schools serving students in this ur urban location. And um, they are well known for prioritizing the social emotional well-being of the students and operating a community hub model um, that engages um, community and family in the work at Distinctive. So Michelle? Thanks so much, Brenda. Um, I believe Karen was held up, unfortunately, with something else, and she's doing her very best to get here as soon as she can. Um, so unless I've missed her somewhere on the screen, I don't think she's yet able to join us. Um, thank you all so much for having us. Uh, we are distinctive schools. Um, for over a decade, we've been really looking to transform and revolutionize uh, what education looks like for students, specifically in the city of Chicago. We serve almost all zip codes. I think there's only two that we haven't touched. We have, as Brenda says, nine schools spanning um, as far north as Irving Park, uh, as far south as 135th Street, uh, which um, is all Gale Gardens, and as far West as Belmont Cragen, and I say we're not in the lake yet, but we'll expand there if a school could be built there. Can go to the next slide. Um, our, our vision is really about creating a sense of belonging 
uh, within our environments. Um, and we have a deep commitment to social justice alongside rigorous learning. Um, we look to bring that joy into the classroom and create strong partnerships with the homeschool environment so that, as I said, that sense of belonging radiates not just to our students, but to our families, our staff members, that everyone feels that community. Okay, keep going. Okay. Um, so in terms of our needs that have been unique to Chicago, uh, along with what we saw for, as a result of the pandemic, and I'm sure this is common in many schools, the um, changes in communication patterns, a lot of social skills struggles um, for our students and you know, our classrooms, given the high density population that we have, often have higher enrollment. So it was a huge shift and drop off for our students to transition from being the only person in the room for a while as they were at home to now being in a room with a lot of stimuli, a lot more people, a lot of different personalities from different backgrounds. And so we've just noticed that that transition um, has come out in a lot of ways. So things like impulse control, challenges with endurance, and um, really sticking with things. And I'm sure a lot of these educators are out there are nodding and saying, yes, I've seen this too. We know it's not unique to us. And just within the city setting, um, we found a lot of these can be heightened and uh, really expanded upon. And then the other big piece that we've seen is kind of the bubble of needs that started prior to the pandemic, but seemed to expand and burst as a result. Um, a lot of anxiety, uh, a high trauma response. Um, many of our students live in neighborhoods in which the environment they live in, maybe their home environment feels very safe and secure, but outside of those doors do not. And they were during the pandemic left to sit with that trauma. Um, obviously, we tried to connect with them as much as possible, creating community hubs, communities in care in which they could come to school. Um, but the time that was a for shelter in place really um, doubled down on those experiences. And many of those happened before the pandemic and continue to happen today. Um, part of a challenge of being in the city setting is that while we can create safe schools, we cannot control what happens just right outside of our doorstep. And when you step off, step out of a school door, you're not just on school campus, you're now on the streets of Chicago. So for example, today, there was a shooting completely unrelated to the school, but it was right across the street from one of our elementary schools. Um, you know, we have windows so we can have sunshine into our classrooms, but then that also means it's windows to the violence that is occurring right there on the street. Um, so finding ways to keep safe spaces and safe bubbles within, you know, what is an uncontrollable area of a city environment, um, and then partnering as much as possible with our older people, our politicians, so that we can expand those bubbles of safety. The other thing that we've really seen as a result of these bursts, um, I know my colleague in the South mentioned they ha don't have a lot of resources. There's maybe one provider. We are very lucky in Chicago to have multiple providers. However, the need um, is multiple as well. And so we're seeing wait lists that are astronomical. Um, for example, there was one caregiver who was trying to figure out why her child was falling asleep. And we were working in class. We were working with her on that. Um, and she was interested in some outside resources. And there was a six month wait list just to get the initial appointment. That's not even to do the assessment or to get interventions or treatment. So we're basically in Chicago telling people sit there for six months, which obviously is not okay with us as a school. So we wanna step in and try and do more. Um, also to name, it's not limited to our students. Uh, again, that's something that has probably been touched on many times uh, as adults are human too. And this is a nationwide problem. We're seeing the teacher shortage, um, the funding cliff, the raise in expectations. And our adults are feeling this both on the teaching side, but also the parent side, which is gonna lead into why we ultimately chose the partnership that we did. 
So for us, um, we really invest in our student support team and social emotional learning pro uh, programs. Um, it's a foundation of our philosophy, the very existence of my position as a network director of clinical services, I, I think names our investment level um, that we want to have a clinician at every campus. We want those clinicians to then be supported. Um, so we have training and development internally, as well as support for external training and development for our own staff members, which include multiple licensed clinicians around the campuses. We have a restorative approach. Um, we also use the MTSS approach, which is that triangle. This is a, it's a pyramid, it's flattened out. Um, I know this has been spoken about by others, so I'm not gonna go into huge detail, but I, I really liked this visual because it does emphasize that it's not just academic. Um, it's not just those who are academically at risk or academically advanced. It's also the self-management and um, behavioral component to it as well. So I encourage you to check that image out in the future. Um, as Brenda mentioned, uh, we have adopted the community hub model as part of our response. Um, and so that means building strong partnerships to provide direct services, making that the school, as I said, the safe space that families um, can come to throughout the community and then doing as much as we can within that bubble of safety. Um, so we bring in outside providers. We've done community mental health providers uh, such as communities and schools um, and also uh, help with other partners such as Headspace and Care Solace as well. Um, from our previous experiences, we've learned that support should be co-constructed, not prescribed. Um, that collaboration and input from those who know best um, are really important. Uh, and that alignment with current systems, so we're not being duplicative uh, and uh, wasting resources or time on things that are already there. Um, and then looking at how can we leave behind a legacy and not just a superficial fix. So the partnership we went with parent guidance um, that we've just started on is, is really that opportunity to fulfill the unmet need that was identified by multiple stakeholders. It's an integrated approach. So it utilizes multiple levels of our system. Um, it's aligned with our MTSS model. Um, it allows for building capacity and doing some of that upstream work with caregivers. Uh, so really investing in them uh, as partners for us. And we found it helpful for accessibility. Thank you so much, Michelle. I feel like I'm rushing you along. Um, there's so much to say, and um, I appreciate you sharing the perspective of an urban um, school looking at these, these issues. Our last um, panel of presenters is from District 41, Glen Ellen, which is a um, suburban district um, in a collar um, community of Chicago in DuPage County. And we have Dr. Melissa Kaskowski, the superintendent to lead us along with um, members of her team, Chris Webster and Erica Craybill. Thank you, Brenda. How are we doing for time? Do you need me to shave it down or? I think you can um, still have up to 15 minutes. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I want to walk you through um, District 41's journey, and I'm not going to repeat um, some of the information that you've already heard, but I do want to start by circling back to our team. Um, not only is it myself, um, as Brenda mentioned, Dr. Christine Webster, she is our Assistant Superintendent for Teaching, Learning, and Accountability. She also has to be, as we call her, Dr. Squared. She also has another, a second doctorate in trauma. So um, her voice and her expertise has been hugely important. Um, Molly Victor is my Executive Director of Student Services, and, and obviously um, everything that we do touches um, student services and our in-house clinicians, um, but also our chief communications officer. And, and I think when we walk through our model and what we've built, 
um, key in this is communication. And so Erica has been part of this since day one, and um, we'll get to how important the communication is as we talk through all of this. Um, I think it's important to note that we are both the planning and the implementation team, as Brenda referred to. So we're not a huge district. We have about 3,500 students, um, five schools. Um, and I think before we walk through the slides, just to share, um, we're extremely fortunate in our journey because I believe um, where we're at with our implementation, which is really about services outside of school, um, I don't believe there's another district that I'm aware of that is actually in implementation with this right now. So we're kind of a, a one-off and we're hoping that we can um, kind of pave the way for both collecting the data and then helping other districts um, determine what might be a, a feasible and sustainable model for their district. You can go on why we began. Um, we observed all of the same needs that all of the presenters have talked about, so I, I won't go through that. Um, we also had an opportunity where we became aware of a federal house appropriations community grant, where literally we had two days um, to gather our thoughts around what's the vision, what is our need, and where do we want this to go. Um, and another driving need was really that, um, as also has been mentioned, is we did have prior experience with trying to use a digital tool. Um, and it really framed my vision um, in terms of the need to work outside of school. Um, we had implemented an online check-in system as part of our universal um, SEL supports for kids. And it was to be part of our entrance for kids in the morning to do a, a quick check-in and then we could triage supports as needed. Um, and just as we learned from staff and parent feedback, um, that was not our entry point. And so we needed to regroup. Um, and this process has given us um, time to do that. Next slide. Um, so getting started, um, one of our big challenges was just learning how to navigate the federal grant process. I'd like to say we've um, figured that all out, but we haven't. We're, we're working our way through it every time we have a meeting with them. Finding partners, um, sometimes your planets align and, and you come across the right people that can help you find partners. I'll talk about that more, but just through professional associations, um, we are, you know, those are how we have um, investigated, vetted, and found our partners. Um, again, time, um, you'll see when we show our model um, that time is really about making this available and doing this outside of school. We had to acknowledge that there's only so much our organization can do um, in the course of our day, um, but also to be responsible to responsive to parents um, and to our own clinicians. So I'll I'll talk about that later. Um, realistic expectations. Um, all of us are pulled in a million and one directions. We all feel in our district a tremendous sense of pressure to be both academically um, very high achieving, but also to meet the enormous needs, uh, mental health needs of our community, our families, and our students. Um, consultant support. We do work with Brenda and Terry, and that's been instrumental in helping us do this in really a very short amount of time. Um, so finding those experts who can support your journey, we have found that is just key. And then I think just taking a leap of faith. Um, you're never gonna get to a point where all of your questions are answered. You never will know how will this go over? Is it gonna be clean? Um, but you have to just jump in. Um, kids need us and families need us to do something. Our biggest commitment was to this monitoring. And as Brenda said, weekly meetings and then adjust, adjust, adjust as we go on. So um, there will never be a point or a day, I think, when you really feel that you've got it all ready or all your I's dotted and T's crossed. But but you need to trust the expertise around you and, and jump in. Bumps in the road, clearly we've experienced some. Um, as I mentioned, our first um, trial of a digital platform did not get the results and did not meet our needs for a variety of reasons. Um, we discovered that by wanting to put this into the hands of parents, we needed a lot of parent input as we started to plan. 
um, engaging with our non-English speaking families and fostering that engagement was a challenge. And so we needed to use um, our, our parent groups that exist to try to build that. And again, um, you'll, you know, I can't talk more about the importance of communication and, and outreach to do that. Um, another challenge that we've experienced was just partnership and stability. Um, as Brenda and Terry specifically mentioned, Kuth um, and the wonderful work that they're doing in California. It also meant when we were getting um, kind of to the 11th hour with implementation, Kuth couldn't service us. And so instead of slowing down our traje trajectory, we, we had to find another partner and just keep that momentum going. Um, some of the other bumps is just ongoing challenges with our federal grant. Um, but if you've ever worked with federal grant or federal anything, you you know that it's riddled with challenges. So that, um, again, we just look at it as we're taking a leap of faith and we continue to do and stay true to the grant. Um, it was important that we started this with the end, end in mind or our vision. Um, so as I've mentioned, this was about building tiered supports outside of the school day really to minimize that learning loss or that loss of instructional time for students. Um, we have a robust um, staffing plan for clinicians and supports and MTSS in our building, um, but we knew that the needs had far extended and overextended our internal staff. And so priority was to really um, make the most of time outside of the day um, and also, as I said, um, really minimize the um, the loss of instructional time for kids, because particularly when you're talking about kids that are already disengaged and highly anxious, taking them out of instruction creates a whole new problem when you introduce them back into the classroom. Um, putting the decisions and the ownership in the hands of parents was really important. Um, in our community, we heard feedback um, we were doing a lot of engagement around a referendum to build a new elementary district. And what I was hearing, um, more so than about the agreement or disagreement with building a new school and funding that construction, was all about mental health and what are we doing and we need more. Um, also heard loud and clear from some of our families and some of our community um, not all think that we should be working in that realm. They see us as school and you should be reading, writing, and math, and stay out of the mental health world. So for us, we had families just knocking down the door to please um, help us help them access mental health supports. But we also had people who didn't want us in that realm. And so by being responsive and putting these decisions and these resources in their hands, um, if they don't want to use them, um, that that is up to them. Um, and then remaining very aware of the need to avoid overtaxing our own clinicians. We are, um, again, very fortunate um, in our district to have um, what I consider to be a really robust um, staffing plan. But again, our own clinicians are, are feeling overstretched and overtaxed um, and overburdened. And just to know that we needed to build this without putting more on their plates because they already have enough. And so um, that was kind of our vision for our work and drove, um, our, drove our decisions. Next slide. Moving forward, um, you know, um, ongoing and responsive communication has been key. Not only do we have our weekly meetings with our team and with Brenda and Terry, um, but connecting with our other parent leadership um, groups and subcommittees within our district to get um, that feedback. Um, and then onboarding new partners to our vision of a tiered system of supports for families. As I had mentioned, when, when Kuth fell off, um, we had to um, go out and find another partner who could step in and help us build our tiers. Um, Brenda might want to jump in and talk a little bit about when we get um, to our tier um, about the partner that we found and what they have brought for us. But as we view this pyramid, um, hearing our partners um, describe our model as flexible and interdependent in that a family can move up and down within our tiers um, as their needs change. 
which takes us into um, where we are now and our tiered system. So I think going into this, um, you know, priorities were that um, our model is free to our families and it is confidential uh, mental health resources that are available to all of our families. Um, driving this um, from some county data that um, has been shared is that 32% of our parents feel that their child is unhappy and an estimated 10 to 20% of adolescents globally experience mental health conditions. I think that message of you're not alone in what you're experiencing in your home um, has resonated with our parents. I'm gonna start um, at tier one and talk about what we have in place and some of our um, data that we have currently. So tier one, we are partnering with parent guidance. Again, all of this is outside of school. Um, parent guidance, we are utilizing their, web hist their website library of courses that are developed by mental health experts. Um, we are offering interactive monthly webinars for D41 families, both in English and then in Spanish. And the order of those topics came, um, we put that to some of our parent leadership groups um, to prioritize from all of the topics that parent guidance offers. And so that really, um, the order that which we're doing them um, really came from parents. And then our Spanish community um, selected some different topics. And, and so again, those are happening on the same night, but don't necessarily have to be the same topics. Um, right as of now, we have had over 1,300 um, visits to the website. We've hosted a total of three webinars where we've had about 360 families um, signed on to those webinars. Um, the beauty is you can participate in the webinar um, when it is live, or you can also sign up and view a recording that um, Parent Guidance makes available, and you can watch it as many times as you need, and you can watch it at your convenience. They're highly interactive, which the feedback that we're getting um, is that the parents who are joining the webinar love that level of um, interaction that's and, and engagement that's taking place. As we move up our tiers to tier two, this is also through parent guidance. We have weekly one-to-one -one virtual parent coaching that is available along with online parent groups. Um, to date, the coaching, we have about 18 families that are taking part in this one-to-one -one intensive coaching and 256 engagements with the online parent groups. Um, that for us, um, when we look at engagement um, with other webinars and similar things that we offer as a district, these numbers are really high, um, which tells us that right now this is resonating within our parent group. Um, as we move into tier three, um, this is where we have onboarded a new partner called Referral GPS. Um, our first step into Referral GPS um, has been their care navigation system, which helps them to locate a therapist that's a good fit for a child. Um, the parent does this. If they need more assistance than that, um, they actually have what Referral GPS refers to as almost a concierge level of service where um, parents can get help and support and timely access to in-person or telehealth appointments with mental health professionals. They again can set these up on their own or referral GPS has somebody that can walk a family through and help them access everything that is part of their care navigation system. Um, most recently, we approved money for um, treatment funds. So again, um, dollars left under this federal grant where we have put money now into a treatment fund where as a district, we will pay up to a certain amount of hours. Um, any parent, any family in our district can access this. Um, it's meant to fill that wait time gap when you're on waiting lists for other providers. Um, it's meant to fill a need for parents who do not have insurance. Um, or parents who do have insurance but are just waiting to navigate um, that system of insurance so that they can get in with their own provider. Um, within this treatment fund, um, it will bleed into tier four, which I'm going to talk about um, for more needed and emergent 
cases, and I'll talk about as we get into tier four. Um, but here is where we're not only utilizing referral GPS, but we've also formed a partnership with the YWCA. Um, and we are providing access to a program that's called Strong Families. And it is weekly home visits to support parents and their children to make changes together. So they are working directly in the home with our most um, families of significant need that need that level of support where it's brought right into their home. Um, to date, we have had five families who are engaged in the Strong Families program, um, and two have actually completed the program and have graduated out. Um, as I said, our, our pyramid is responsive and flexible, so those families now that they have graduated out of our Tier 4 can actually access services in any of the levels where their needs might fit at this point. Um, again, within referral GPS, when I mentioned that there are um, options that we would consider um, in emergency cases, um, we have the ability to work with referral GPS or they with us um, without any need to share family or student information, but they know that they can contact the district if we have the need for an emergency assessment or a need for emergency medication management um, or anything out of the norm for this treatment fund, they could come to us and um, we could approve um, those expenses. And again, we'll be monitoring as both Terry and Brenda said, um, there is a, a dashboard for our district. And so we can monitor how those funds are going over time. Um, moving into our future focus just will be all of the data monitoring that goes along with this and that's required by the federal grant, but we'll be looking specifically as what is the impact of these supports, because that will feed directly into sustainability. How do we fund this when the grant is over? Um, what other grants are available? How do we utilize and make a case to utilize district resources because we can support it by the data of what has made the biggest impact and what has resonated most with our families? Um, something that people may not consider, but has been really in, been important so far and will be. Um, this is my retirement year, so it's been crucially important for me that um, this becomes part of my transition with the incoming superintendent so that this is not a one and done year for us and that this can flow seamlessly into future years and future decisions and, and plans for the district. So um, this will be an instrumental part of our transition together. So that is it. And thank you for um, hearing about our journey in D41. Thank you. Am I muted? Okay, good. I'm not muted. Um, thank you so much, um, Melissa, for sharing about um, the progress. Um, just really two months of implementation. That data was from November and December, and um, we're delighted to be able to share that um, across our uh, progress across rural, urban, and um, suburban locations. So what we want to do now is open up um, for questions. And I'd like to encourage our panelists, um, if there are comments that you didn't get to make because I was pushing you um, along with the with the timer, um, please um, please speak up during the um, the panel um, time. Uh, Luke. Yeah, I've uh, I, some of the questions here in the Q and A function were just asking about slides and things like that. So before we get more of those, I just want to go ahead and and reiterate uh, to everyone that. All attendees will receive a PDF copy of the slide deck and the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center will be hosting the video on demand on our YouTube channel following the conclusion of the Q&A uh, and when we adjourn. Um, so I'm just going to go in chronological order here. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Sarah Stills. If we wanted to provide support or resources to teens in need, what's the best way to get in touch with everybody here? And I think I might be able to actually facilitate that a little bit. Um, you might uh, contact me to begin with, just because I sort of am the nexus of the connection point with Dr. Huber, Terry, the Partnership for Connection, uh, Connected Illinois, as well as the rest of the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center region. So I'm going to put my email in the chat, and that way I can just get permission from all of our panelists um, 
as well as any other uh, points of contact they may have to send you along to them and make uh, digital introductions that way. Um, and then you'll have me in your contact list as well if you have any uh, further TA needs or want to just uh, explore how we can collaborate in the future. Uh, the next one, and I know Kimberly had to drop off a little early, um, so this is from Kimberly Haynes, um, is, and I and I believe that this was early on in the presentation, so uh, is this group connected to the Children's Behavioral Health Transformation Initiative? They are also promoting universal screeners in schools. So I can, I can address that. Um, so we are in communication. We are not part of that um, transform transformation initiative, but we are in communication with the various committees um, out of Chapin Hall and um, Dr. Dana Weiner's team. And um, uh, I think Terry mentioned some of the uh, vendors that we've identified in this space have built-in screeners to be used for universal screening. The majority of them don't. The majority of them have um, what you might call a screener to help plan treatment. So using things that would help identify whether uh, a young person's having more internalizing problems like depression or anxiety or um, uh, kind of helping to curate the resources that would be needed for a particular family. Um, and then, uh, Terry, it looks like you answered Kimberly's other question, which is uh, whether or not you are looking for other school districts to participate in pilot programs. But this might be useful just to go ahead and address for anybody else who might have a similar question. Yeah, um, broadly speaking, we, we, we've done a ton of research on the players out there that are supporting schools, uh, although occasionally we find another and another. Um, so we stay on top of that. We get updates um, every four to six months because things change. Uh, so we, we we do stay on top of it. But the key to all of this is we, we want to develop more pilots. Um, so we're looking for pilots for the 2024-25 school year. Um, we feel, and Brenda covered this in, in her comments, but we feel that if we can get enough pilots so that we can see the results and we can find best practices like like you heard from Melissa we'll be able to put that out there and really facilitate we're doing this for another year and a half um, but we feel we call it the greater good if we can take the lessons learned and put those out there for all of Illinois um, this whole adoption uh, process will be faster and and be more effective. So we do we we are looking for more pilots over the next year. If, now we do have any, some well, limitations just... in terms of size of you know we and, and we get funding to do some of that, but we work with you as well to get funding for these programs. And there is a real diversity. I come back to these different uh, tools and resources. There's quite a diversity in terms of um, not only what they offer, but what, what it costs to use these services. Brenda? Terry, I'm sorry I interrupted you. I was just yeah. going to say if there's anybody on the call who has come across um, a digital tool or resource or service that yes. um, you um, think is great, please let us know. We'd be, um, we, we have no um, allegiance to any of these companies or vendors, and um, we'd be glad to check them out and um, gather some information and, and add them into our side-by-side -side that we have of all the vendors. So we sort of feel like we have best in show, um, you know, of uh, the various things that um, companies are developing, but we um, are eager to, to learn of more. Um, the next one here comes from uh, Beverly Watkins. Um, Brenda, can you talk more about the pitfalls that have stopped some of the other interventions from being used? Um, this, I think, was in response to when you were speaking of some of the other, like, just material concerns of, like, not using the technology itself. Um, perhaps there's other things that you can address here. Yeah, just really quickly, I think, um, you know, obviously stigma, always. Um, some, you know, um, folks um, would uh, prefer to meet with a person in person. 
And so there's some resistance. Um, we we are finding that um, it's mixed um, with youth. If we if we can get them to to log on and connect, um, they tend to to use it, right? But um, just that initial, how do we get people um, to jump in and actually log in or click that kind of thing? Um, it's that's an important important piece. Another barrier is. Um, uh, in addition to sort of the communication and the um, the PR about um, a new tool is um, how hard it is to integrate it with what's already happening in the school. Um, everybody sees the school as a great place to implement some, these kinds of programs. But if it's not really hand in glove with what's already happening there, one of the things I love about um, Melissa sharing that triangle is you can see that some of those tools are digital and some of them are brick and mortar. And there, um, there's a blend between what the school is doing, what the community agencies are providing, and what um, this you know, a digital um, resource or service is providing. And that's pretty nuanced um, work. But I would say... I. I I would sum it up and um, the barrier is getting to people to actually log in and access a resource. Um, and that could be a multitude, you know, it could be stigma, it could be um, connectivity, it could be um, just awareness um, and getting the word um, to folks. And um, we, we try to work to, um, you know, like Erica, we've been talking about, you know, testimonials, you know, like, so people, who um, the the um, district students and families respect talking about having used the tools and and what they think about them having been part of the webinars, et cetera. I just so want to share, there were three strategies that we used that I think are working for us. And again, we're still in the beginning, you know, going into our third month, but that's one is just elevating the importance of this and having our superintendent and Dr. Kaskowski going to our bilingual parent advisory committee and talking to people, uh, you know, face to face and in person, going to our PTA councils, asking them for topics that are of interest to them. It can't just be the district office. It has to be the principals and the staff. It's everyone. So it the superintendent really made it clear that this is not just a normal initiative, like we are elevating this to a different level, to the point where we invited the congressman who supported our grant to a PTA council meeting to say, this is big here and we need that support. Um, two, uh, the second thing is that we implemented this in a layered approach. So we didn't just put it all and say, we have 10 new resources. We came them out slowly. We said, here's something new. We have some new things. We're going to be rolling them out. And once we see what works, we adjust to what's next. And finally, I would say to be creative. Uh, for example, with the Spanish speaking families, we engaged our multilingual uh, family liaison. And she, after the, after the first webinar, said, okay, this isn't working, just telling them about it. I'm going to host a watch party and I'm going to invite families here and we're going to watch it together. So being creative and kind of figuring out how to, to break that barrier because this is so personal, mental health is so personal that we're making it personal. So I just wanted to share kind of what's been working for us so far. And on a broader level, and, and they've been doing an amazing job, um, on a broader level, we have found, our PCI team has found that most schools are not aware of this category of resources. They're still trying to, uh, if they do find money, they're trying to hire and keep staff, therapists. Um, and that is just such a, um, an elusive goal. Um, it's very, very difficult climate right now. So um, this is kind of an aha moment, at least over the last year it's been. Hopefully uh, in the next 12 months, people will be much more familiar. That's why we're doing this session. So just broader awareness of this category of resources is a barrier. I think uh, some of our some of our panelists are are typing in real time here to uh, questions, which is great. Um, let's see. I think uh, I'll just go chronological order here in the order that we received them. So we have one from uh, one of our attendees that asks if there's a major concern for a student that comes up on the screen or say they flag for something, who's responsible for the cost, that sort of thing. I know this is something that when we did our uh, HRSA funded school clinic network, we ran into this quite a bit with behavioral health integration because people would be concerned about A, cost, and B, liability if, you know, you screen the entire 10th grade class or whatever, 
and you have 20% of one cluster flag for potential suicidal ideation or something like that. And you don't have the resources to refer them to, you know, who eats that? What's the different, what's the protocol, that kind of thing. There's these questions are awesome. There's just so much that one could say about them. Um, so um, parent permission, stigma, all of that is, are literally the kinds of things that we talked about, talk about when we're working on the implementation. Um, so um, for screeners, for interventions and, and for services and thinking about um, uh, because every school is different. Right, and every school culture is different. So, working with the the district to um, to respond in a way that's going to meet the needs of their of their district. Sorry, I felt like a lame answer. Yeah, it's um, that whole question um, of screeners and what that triggers in terms of those two issues is one of the main discussion areas about when and how to phase in screeners. Um, there's not a good answer to it. It's a huge issue. Uh, once identified, how are those needs supported? That's kind of why we quickly want to get these pilots, as many as possible, going so that there's more awareness and some testing validation of what's out there as potential resources in solving this. But clearly, six months waiting to see someone for one appointment it is not going to cut it. Just in terms of the question around screeners, one of the ways that we've handled this is one to be really thoughtful about what you're asking for, um, because if you get information, what are you going to do with that information and recognizing the capacity of your staff to respond to that information in terms of um, kind of thinking through the parent permission around this. A lot of our initiatives around screeners that have been built into evaluation feedback loops that we get from multiple stakeholders are part of the conversations we have with those multiple stakeholders, uh, family members, students, staff members, about what kind of feedback they want to be able to give um, and what our joint goals are. And that has given a pathway to say, okay, we want to make sure that our students feel safe. Do we have spaces where they can um, share concerns about safety as it relates to school or otherwise. And then we can get backing for, okay, we're going to use this service or this partner to help us collect that information. And then we really work to have a cohesive plan of once we get that information, how are we going to respond to that and prepare for the possible different responses that we might get. So I think partnership and planning are probably the two, two Ps I would put with that one. I'd like to throw in, um, we ended up pushing off our implementation of a universal screener until next year, um, partially because this was an urgent priority for us and we needed to get this up and running um, to see what our parents would use and connect with, um, but also to work through the kinks of permission around a screener in an elementary district world. Um, and so where I believe we're going to land is that um, it will be an opt out um, based on input from our legal counsel is that this is part of our normal screening protocols, but we would allow for a parent to opt out. Um, that's just not a, you know, a battle that is a, as a district we would take on, um, you know, and then hopefully working, having our clinicians explain the importance to the parents. But um, I believe we will end up um, being an opt out situation when the screener gets implemented next year. All right, well said, everybody. And I think that that actually does get us through all of the Q's and A just under five minutes over time. So I think we actually were quite efficient there. Thank you to the panelists who were answering live uh, via text. Um, just a couple housekeeping items before we conclude here. Um, I would like to uh, once again uh, say thank you to uh, the foundations who have helped make this event possible, the VNA Foundation and the Sprague Memorial Institute, um, as well as all of our other partners, uh, the Association of Community Mental Health Authorities, 
Community Behavioral Healthcare Association of Illinois, the Illinois Association of Medicaid Health Plans, the Illinois Critical Access Hospital Network, the Illinois Health and Hospital Association, as well as the Mental Health Summit. And um, I also did see, I wanted to call this out, I had mentioned it uh, to Marianne in the chat, but um, the National Association on Mental Illness has also joined us on this call and is offering uh, publications and resources, um, and we will put you in touch with them um, as that need arises. Once again, we are the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. My name is Luke Wortley, the project director. Um, we really appreciate you all coming out and uh, supporting the partnership for a connected Illinois. I am also going to um, hand it back over to Nancy briefly to do some final bits of housekeeping. And then my and my last note is that I will be typing a Survey Monkey link into the chat for evaluation purposes. This will also be included on the email that is sent out with the slides uh, to all attendees. Um, so please be sure to complete that as those metrics uh, are extremely important for continuing to do this important work. Thank you, Luke. Uh, on behalf of the Partnership for Connected Illinois, I want to thank these extraordinary speakers we had, not only for what we've heard today, but the fine work that they are doing day in and day out, and it's just extraordinary. I want to thank uh, Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center for being there when we really needed you and being a great resource to connecting us with people uh, nationally. I'd like to thank our supporting organizations that uh, Luke identified and our two foundations, the VNA Foundation. Foundation and Sprague Memorial Institute. And most importantly, I want to thank the audience. I want to thank you for listening in and asking your questions, being interested in this topic, and hopefully moving this ball forward in terms of helping these kids that so desperately need our help. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I was just going to mention that my email address, along with Luke's, is in the chat. So if we failed to answer um, any of the questions um, thoroughly, or if you have other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Happy to um, dialogue with any of you and uh, look forward to meeting you. I love the way the clapping hands and the hearts are all em emanating from the bottom of the screen. I don't know how that works, but it it's a lot of fun. Thank you all. All right, with that, we will go ahead and conclude. Thank you everybody for attending.